Good morning and welcome to this gathering of Wendell Christian Church. We are gathered here in various forms. A few folks are there in the sanctuary. A few folks are on Facebook and the FM station 91.1 and, uh, and then here on Zoom. Uh, we're really glad that you're gathered here with us. I would remind you that this is in our places and in places around the world a gathering of the body of Christ. We are the ones who are being healed of our sin. We are being healed of the ways in which we could not love ourselves, our neighbors, our, even our enemies, and our world. We are the ones who are proclaiming the good news that no matter who you are and where you've been, no matter what you've done, you are welcome into this place, into this gathering of a community, an assembly of people, who have believed that they were graciously forgiven and, in, and indwell, are indwelled by the Holy Spirit of God and have the capacity to become transformed and then actually become a demonstration of that transformation for the rest of the world so that people who are in dismay, people who are hopeless, people who are struggling and uh, enslaved to the way they've been can hear the good news that that's not the intent of God and not where you're stuck. So we're gathered here as Christians, little Christ, and we're really glad that you're here with us. Let's share our welcome. After the first line, we'll share the international sign of I love you. Since we're not, we're not gathered together in the old world where we can share a hug and that holy kiss. So here, let's, let's read our welcome together. After the first line, we'll, we'll say I love you. Let's read it together. Welcome, all who are here, welcome. welcome. Welcome, my physical, mental, and spiritual self to this moment. Welcome. Welcome, spirit of the risen Christ among us. Welcome. Together, we willingly enter communion, one with another. Welcome. Let's sing spirit of the living God. <clears throat> Let's read our I should have called. You're muted, George. Am I muted now? No. Okay. Let's read our call to worship responsibly. Thank you. We gather together in the name of Jesus Christ. And members of God's family and brothers and sisters to one another. There are no outsiders here among us. No, no one has, has any special standing or bragging rights. We have all been brought together by the redeeming love of Jesus. Let, Let us, all us all join together in worship of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's <clears throat> sing, Oh, for a Thousand Tongues to Sing.
to. Let's go to our Lord in prayer this morning. Lord, we do gather this morning to praise you among those who are gathered around the world singing praises to you. We praise you always because you are our creator, our lover, our sustainer, our savior, our Lord. Today, I invite us all to praise, especially this morning, because you are the one who keeps patient with us, stays patient with us, who continues to forgive us and transform us into the image of your son, Jesus Christ. He is our Emmanuel. He came and took residence among us. He is the way that you became present with us in a beautiful, unique way in our history, in our world, going through our struggles and our sufferings. And you have been with us and have conquered death and sin through the cross and the resurrection. And you are now present within us and you are working to transform us. And we offer you praise because every time we stumble, you pick us up. Every time we sin, you offer us grace. And every time we return home, your heaven rejoices. Because you have said that you have, there's great rejoicing in heaven when even one of us sinners comes to ourselves and returns home, when even one of us understands more and experiences more of your love. So we offer you praise because of the way that you have loved us so marvelously, so completely. And so we ask that you would help us to continue to teach, to continue to learn what you teach us and to become even more and more an embodiment of the prayer that you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We come now to where we can share our prayer concerns. Lord, right now we come to you in prayer because on our good days, our eyes of faith remind us that everything good comes from your hand, that you are part of all the goodness. Every instinct to love well is yours. Every instinct to provide is yours. Every instinct to forgive, to move on, Every way in which our lives continue as seeds die in the ground and are planted and germinate and bring up new life, you're with us through every transition in the good things and the way you sustain us. Help us to remember that you are also good and present in the midst of struggles. And even when we suffer from sickness and disease, even when we suffer from the hardships caused by other people's choices and even our own, as we persist as humanity in sin, remind us that you are present with us even in the midst of this age and will be present with us even to the next age. And so be with us now in this moment. Lift us up. Encourage and heal the people we've prayed for. Bring them through every transition. Give us eyes not only to see your presence and your activity, but give us an understanding of how we participate in your life and your love. Help us especially to remember the people on the front lines of our world, people who are serving and suffering and struggling, people who have needs that are more than our needs, people who we are being moved to be generous with. We pray that you would help us to be your people 
to be an expression of your love in the midst of our world. And we thank you, Lord, that you're with us, and we lift these prayers to you in the, in the eyes and the, and the heart of faith so that we can really be your children. In Jesus' name, amen. It is my pleasure to invite everyone who's listening live today and who will listen later to pause, maybe even pause the recording if you're listening to it, get you something to be the bread and something to be your cup and participate in the Lord's Supper today. In addition to any way, the Lord would like to remind you by his Holy Spirit of his love and his grace and the life that he has in your life and in your world. I would invite us to also remember as we take communion this morning, that we are the people who are meeting together to be restored and transformed, that we are the people who meet with each other to encourage each other, to, to face off with each other in this serious business of learning to know and experience the love of God and help the others around us know and experience that same love. So in the fullness of and an in invitation into the awareness of the love of God, I invite you, whoever you are, wherever you are, to accept this Lord Jesus Christ this morning and be present with us in, in Christ's presence. Amen. Let's sing our hymn of communion, Seek Ye First. And uh, Rob, if you can hear me, let's sing it through twice. Uh, it only has two verses. I'd like to be able to sing it through twice. It'd be great. Thank you. <clears throat> Cree Campbell is going to lead us in prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, God of love, God of mercy, we come again to the table. Reminiscence of our coming to the table every day. We come to receive the bread as we were instructed on that last night when Jesus met with his disciples. And so we, the disciples of today, come hearing that message again. 
This is the body that was given in sacrifice on a dirty cross, and it was given for payment of our sins. Our sins had put Jesus on the cross. We ask forgiveness for those sins, knowing that because of this sacrifice, we are granted that just as we are granted the forgiveness when we receive this bread, we pray that we may be an example of what Christ taught us when he was on this earth. We are so grateful for the opportunity to be with each other, to fellowship as we had been instructed also and to share love and to show love even to those who do not love us. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Jesus said, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me so they can eat. Now our elder Tammy Fuller is going to lead us in prayer. O oh, great love, lover of all mankind, creator of all that is good and kind, we are grateful, grateful that you chose us before the beginning of time to be your people. We are grateful that you provide for us and this reminder that this blood, the life-giving blood, is for all people. Thank you, thank you so much. And may we be the people together as a community to bring that love to all people. May we, we be the ones that celebrate who Jesus really is and may we be the ones that help your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Just thank you for the privilege, dear God. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Do this in remembrance of him. Just as we have done in the midst of the table with the bread and the cup offering ourselves as living sacrifices, as acts of worship, we also dedicate a portion of what we have, our tithes and our offerings to the support of our church and the work of Christ around the world. Um, I understand that the last month, at the end of last month, the giving wasn't quite as what it was the month before, but um, I know that um, all of you are making the support of our church a matter of prayer and working that in with all the challenges that you and the people you love are going through and you're following God's will as to how you would support us and our church and those other needs that are so pressing around the world. I know it's a matter of as a few days a week, Tammy and I pause again to think about how we are to continue not only to support our church and our family, but uh, people we come, become aware of who are in need and people we become aware of who are meeting those needs. And we recently were able to be part of that with uh, through Mike and Judy Harrison, and we're so grateful for that effort in Bertie County. But continue just to be faithful. And we will, as a church, um, use what we've been given with good stewardship and, and uh, deliberate spending so that we can become the persons and the fellowship that we were intended to be. So God bless our offerings of ourselves and our resources in every way that you lead us in Jesus name. Amen. We come now to the scripture reading and Barbara Pratt is going to share our scripture with us this morning. Let's pray. Dear Holy Jehovah, Thank you for taking such good care of us. Thank you for holding us tight. Thank you for showing us through this dark time. We pray, Lord, that our country would unite again, that we would love each other all over this world, but here in the United States. We have lost our way, Lord, and we pray that you would help us back. Please bless us again, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Matthew 18, 15 through 20, New International Version. If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their faults just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose in heaven or on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly, I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three gather in my name, there am I with them. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Barbara. Today, I'd like to talk about the reality that we are becoming Christ together. Uh, this passage that Barbara read um, is, is one that's misused a whole lot in the church. And part of it's just because it's read out of context. It's not read as the, a part of a bigger series of sayings and teachings and episodes in Jesus' life. And so for a lot of people and, and many churches and in some classes that I've had along the way, it, it's used as an effort to say this is when people are allowed to stay in church, you know, like in Wendell Christian Church, and when people are told not that they can no longer be part of Wendell Christian Church, of a particular church community, um, or a broader church community, because there have been disciplinary actions where denominations have said to groups of Christians, you can't be part of us. And keep listening. I'm not going to suggest that this isn't about understanding one way of relating and then because of sin and the way we're relating to not i'm not saying we don't change the way we relate but i would like you to just open up your mind and you may have already heard this understood the way i'm going to explain it because plenty of people do understand it the way i explain it i will explain it but oftentimes in my experience and in my conversations even with other ministers there seems to be an effort uh, to either use this passage or ignore this passage, and I don't think we can ignore it. I think we can use it, especially if we use it in the way I think Christ intended it in the context of the Gospel of Matthew. So keep listening, because this is uh, about how we are becoming Christ together. And remember, Christian means little Christ, and so it's about being Christian. This is how we are part of becoming Christian together. The first thing I'd like you to do is to notice the stories before and after this passage. And if you notice the stories before and after, I'm going to just take a look at the, the 18th chapter of Matthew, Matthew chapter 18. But I invite you to look farther before this passage and after this passage. And I'm suggesting that, the, that Matthew, when this but gospel was put together was actually trying to say, here's a collection of the sayings around which you can understand and in which you can understand and through which you can understand how we are to be together as the church, as the assembly of God. So notice that. Let's just take a quick look. And I'm just going to talk, tell you, talk you through chapter 18 so that we can put it in context. And then you can read it on your own as you would like and read it prayerfully. In verses 1 to 5 of chapter 18, Jesus calls the children together and says, don't encumber any one of them. In fact, he says, if you're not going to come into this fellowship, into this group of people that I'm forming, this ecclesia, this church, if you're not going to come together as children, in other words, ready to learn and ready to be parented, ready to be shaped and transformed and grow up and mature, if you're not going to come with that, then you, you don't understand what I'm talking about. So this is a community of coming together and learning and growing and sharing. And in fact, he says, you shouldn't be one who makes people stumble. And you may think children means people under 18 in our culture. I think it means the people who are at the beginning of their journey, whether they're young in age or young in the faith. I think Jesus is being very clear, and the Apostle Paul was 
extremely clear in his letters that when people are new in the faith or when children are present, you're, you're especially diligent to help them learn through your example and your teachings how to become Christ, how to be transformed into Christians, how to be found as faithful as the ones who follow Christ and love like Christ. And he says, if, you, if your eye makes you stumble, pluck your eye out. If your, arm, if your hand makes you stumble, chop your hand off. And I have known through history a few people who took that literally and literally did just that. But they were chasing a moral perfection, some sense that they did everything right. And if they kept having the same sin, stumbling over the same sin, they thought, well, then you do this literal take plucking your eye out, cutting your hand off. I would like to suggest that you might ad admire that faithfulness, and some might even interpret it that way. I think what Jesus is saying very plainly, he is saying it very plainly. He's saying it very, very truly, truly, I say to you is often the phrase he would use. I'm telling you, take it seriously. If you keep leading people astray, if you keep stumbling and, and hurting people and holding resentments and not forgiving sin and, doing, and going against the things I teach you in your fellowship, it's very serious because then you, it says, he says, you might as well put a, a rope around your neck and, and a rock and throw it into the, into the ocean. You might as well recognize that you are part of the eternal fire. And please remember, I don't think eternal fire is always interpreted as what happens after you die. I think the eternal fire is that ongoing reality that if we are not going to love and forgive, if we are not going to accept the true identities that we have in Christ, if we are not going to participate and cooperate with God, we are in a fire. There's weeping and gnashing of teeth, and I would just submit to you, stop, look around the world right now. There are plenty of people who are Christian and who are the stumbling blocks, who are the reason that people can't understand Christ and will not receive Christ because their lives are so much out of harmony with who Jesus Christ was. And they are part of why the fires of hell, the eternal fires of hell keep burning because they keep stoking the fires with their own life, their own refusal to receive the love of God. And that is in Jesus' mind is a warning, but it's not the kind of warning that I think most people hear, like some kind of big ultimatum with some terrible thing ahead of him. What he's saying is he's just being honest with us. He's saying this is how it is. People stumble and fall, and they're suffering because we don't learn to love and we don't take it seriously. In fact, he says if even one of the least of this, this young Christian, these people watching you, the unbelievers around us, if they don't see us living and learning like Christ, just remember that every one of them has an angel. And when you see their face, you're seeing the face of an angel because God loves them and cares for them and wants them to grow up. And then he says a parable that in Luke, Luke in chapter 15 of Luke, he, he combines this story with a lost coin and a lost son. But he says, you know, there's 90, there's 100 sheep and one sheep wanders off. Of course, the shepherd, he goes and finds the one sheep. And when the one sheep's found, there's this great big party because there's more rejoicing over the one who was brought back, the one who wandered away and is brought back, the one who forgets the love of God and is reminded and comes back in the love of God. The one who gets caught up in sin and addiction and struggles and, and hatred and, and all of that. And in the midst of all of that gets brought back. There's a huge party in heaven because of that. And, it's, and Jesus is saying, just keep that in mind, that the goal is to bring people back. And then there's our passage. And then after our passage, P Peter wants to find out if he's heard it right. So after our passage, Peter's like, if Jesus has said that, and then Peter says, so how many times should I forgive people? As many as seven times? And Jesus said, no, I tell you not seven, but seven times seven. Just keep on forgiving. In fact, that's the thing you need to learn very plainly, is that you keep on forgiving one another and restoring one another and growing into Christ. So that's the context. And now I'd like us to listen to the the passage again. I'm going to ask Barbara if she will again read the passage for us and put it in that context as you hear it this time. Go ahead, Barbara. If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two along 
so that every matter might be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three gather in my name, there am I with them. Amen. Thank you, Barbara. So, this is in the context of that Jesus is teaching how his people, and you get to choose, are you part of his people? But, but God's people relate to God and to one another. And again, it's always a choice. Not only the choice when you first pray to receive Christ, when you first come into awareness of God's love and grace in Christ, uh, when you go through that and to go through baptism. But each day we get to choose, are we going to be God's people? So here's the second thing I like to think about and notice is that this is between members of the ecclesia. I'm going to unpack that word in a minute, the church. These are people together in love. We are people together in love. That is agape love, a specific kind of love of Jesus Christ. So let's think about that, this passage that Barbara has read for us, these words of Jesus. We're members of the ecclesia. In other words, I'm part of you as a member. You're part of me. We're part of one another's lives, and we're part of the ecclesia, which is the word assembly. And this word only appears twice in the Gospels, only twice, and both times in, in, in Matthew. Remember, Peter says, you're the, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God, and Jesus says, on that kind of faith, that faith, that reality, I'm going to build my ecclesia, my assembly, and that assembly is going to live their life, and the gates of hell cannot prevail against that assembly. That assembly wins over hell, over sin, over death, over the things that cause us eternal fire, weeping and gnashing of teeth and hurt. We get to be the ones who win over that in our own lives and in our world. How? Because we are that kind of assembly, that ecclesia. And then here's the second time. Here where Jesus in this passage is saying that that is his church that that acts this way. Because we are that people. It is and this is not for the world. Like, don't be surprised when you, when you and the people you know in the world we live in who are not choosing each day, each day, each moment to follow Christ as Lord, to be the ecclesia, the assembly of Christ, when we don't choose that, that it turns out bad. That there are resentments and hardships and weeping and gnashing of teeth and, and, and wars and rumors of wars. And Jesus was really clear. That's the way it's going to be in the world, but not according to you. In that age, when you live in that age, the age of the world being run by people of the world, that goes one way. But when it's God's love, the age of Christ, the, the people who relate in harmony and in the life of Jesus Christ, it's, it's different for them. So think of the motivation. Here's something that I hope I can communicate. Think of the motivation. It is not a, a condemnation that Jesus is talking about. It's not a judgment in the sense of looking for a reason to think less of somebody and a reason to cast them out. No, it's just the opposite. This is when somebody, you see somebody drowning and it's somebody you love and you're standing there on the side of the pool and they're drowning. And you don't think, look, that guy can't swim. He should have learned how to swim by now. Just let him drown. That's just the way it goes. I know you think I should love that guy, but he had a chance to learn to swim and he can't swim. Just let the guy drown. That's just the way it goes for people who do those kind of things and don't learn to swim. That's the way it is. No, I'm telling you, that's not the way it is. You love that person in the water, you will not let them drown. You will not let them drown. You will not, not let them drown. And when we see people in sin, we are seeing people who are drowned, drowning in sin, losing touch with the love of God, going under in the depression and the struggles and the anxieties of the world. And we cannot stand for it because we love them. And we cannot stop loving them because our Christ loves them. And we can't stop loving them because our Christ loves them the same way our Christ loves us. And it's that love that we know that motivates us 
to jump in the water if we can save them, to throw a life buoy out if we can save them, to call everybody, to, dra to drain the pool and just say, please stop. Come back. One person helps the person uh, not drown, and two people help them. You go before the church, but you can't let that person and their struggles take more and more under with them. Of course you can't. So the motivation is to save someone. And this is motivation that comes from the people who are fully committed, and it comes from people who want to learn how to swim, who have not decided to give up and to give in to the world and to the places where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth and resentments are held and relationships sour and there's a need for armies and, and violence in order to maintain some sense of order. But it's a place where love and grace transforms everything. You see, our pain, the eternal fire that the New Testament talks about, is about broken relationships and it's about animosity and struggles and wars. And God says, restore them. Everybody you see in those relationships, come and restore them. Anyone who sins, restore them. In fact, in that passage that Barbara read, it says if, you're, if your brother or sister sins, then you restore them. In other texts, so there's old texts that, that say it just like Barbara read it. If someone sins, then you restore them. In newer texts, the times that came later, and in many translations you'll see the, that it, the translators keep it, and it says, if anyone sins against you, then go. And so what some interpreters will say is that it said anyone who sins, and then it's like, well, you need to mind your own business. So if they're not sinning against you, then you don't, you don't bother. Um, and I would just say that that's, that's not the testimony of Christ, nor the practice of the Apostle Paul or the Apostle John in his writings, or the Apostle Peter in his writings. When we see someone drowning, when we see someone under the influence of and being dominated by sin that's causing them and others pain and struggle and anxiety and depression and just misery. No, we're the ones who say that cannot be left alone. We cannot override their choice. In other words, people can persist in sin. People can keep doing what they've been doing that's harmful. But it's not going to be for lack of us going to them and wanting to bring them back into fellowship. In fact, the way the passage says it, as Barbara read it, is that if they don't turn back, you don't cast them out and not relate to them at all. You treat them like pagans and tax collectors. Keep listening. Keep listening. Read the whole gospel. Read all the gospels. Read the, the, the testimony of John's letters and Peter's letters and Paul's letters. Please listen. When you treat somebody like a pagan and a tax collector, you are not kicking them out of your life and treating them with animosity. You love them. In fact, Jesus is called the friend of sinners. One of the reasons he was put on the cross was he was a friend of sinners. You do not stop relating to people who won't s understand their sin and come back in. But if they're part of the committed people of Christ, if people say they're Christian, if people are committed to Christ and they're not living in a committed life with Christ, they're drowning. And you don't need to judge them and condemn them and cast them out. What you need to do is say, I need to bring them back. Just as surely as I'm going after the lost sheep that's a pagan and the lost sheep that's a tax collector, you end up in a party in Zacchaeus' house. You remember Jesus comes to town in Jericho? Did the disciples think that night they'd be having a party in Zacchaeus' house and this tax collector sinner would be a testimony of Christ and would give his, his money to, to the poor and restore and make restoration for all the harm he had done? Would they even imagine that? No, but Jesus taught that treated that tax collector as someone he loved. And so it is for us when we treat one another and everyone, including the pagans and the tax collectors, as if we love them. We're just not wanting people to be deceived. When you cannot understand, experience, and live in the love of God and share the love of God with others, you are living like a pagan and a tax collector who does not understand it, who does not receive it, who is not, a, who is not following it, and who is not producing the fruit of the Holy Spirit. That's nothing to be cast out of relationship with. You don't say, I'm never going to have anything to do with you anymore. What you do is you treat them differently. In fact, when Paul, he does discipline in his letters, and he says, put them out of the fellowship, he's not talking about put them out of your life where you never relate to them again. But again, treat them as if they are what their fruit tells you they are. 
I tell you. I remember coaching baseball, and there was a boy who kept telling me he wanted to be Ken Griffey Jr. He was a young kid. I think he was like eight years old. And he kept telling me he wanted to be as good as Ken Griffey Jr. at baseball. And then I gave him a, a drill to do and to help him with the way his arm, his arm motion came across when he was throwing the ball because he wanted to be an outfielder and wanted to have a strong arm. And I gave him a, a gr drill to do, and I showed it to his parents. And he came back to practice the next week, and I walked up to his parents and said, how'd it go? It's what? That drill that I gave, gave him to do, how was it when he did the drill? And the parents said, oh, he didn't do that. I said, oh, okay. And then I went to the the boy and I said I thought you wanted to be like King Griffey Jr. and he said yeah and I said well then why didn't you do the drill and he was he just looked at me like what do you mean like what happened was he wanted to be King Griffey Jr. at baseball practice or King Griffey Jr. at a baseball game but he didn't want to become King Griffey Jr. because King Griffey Jr. throws the ball a thousand times a day he swings about a hundred times a day he takes classes and learns and and does all kinds of things because he wants to be perfected into this mature baseball player called King Griffey Jr. And the people who are Christian have decided we want to be Christ. And that is what I struggle with. I don't know how it is with you, but when I feel guilt, when I feel shame, it's oftentimes around the fact that I woke, realize I woke up this morning, I lived my whole life, and I didn't reference Christ. And because of that, Tammy and other people in my life did not experience Christ the way I was made to help them experience Christ. I encountered neighbors, and they didn't experience Christ. And I must repent. I must come back. And when, when whoever it is in my life notices that I'm missing out and I'm drifting away and they hold me accountable and they come and say to me, they're not there because I'm arrogantly living my life, even though it might show up as arrogance. They realize that what I'm doing is I'm drowning and I need help. Someone needs to convince me that I'm going under and stop before I drown. That's the way it's intended to be heard. And so the last thing I'd like to remind you of is that the church is the assembly of people who seek and ask for the kingdom of God and then help one another become the demonstration of God's love in the world. And the last little statement there on the slide is this takes transformation. I am not telling you to do something you ought to do just because you heard me talk. Absolutely not. Do not burden yourself with that. I am not asking you to do something you ought to do simply because you heard somebody talk about it. I'm explaining what we can do together because Christ is alive in us, because the Holy Spirit transforms us. It's about transformation. We are the assembly, the ecclesia, the ones who are proving the will of God in the world. In Galatians 6, 1, remember Paul says, if, if your brother's wandering away, restore him gently. How do you restore somebody? Do you, is one time restore him gently and one time restore him face-to-face uh, -face in some kind of face-off? And I would just like to say, Jesus was really clear in this passage Barbara read for us. Go tenderly with yourself. Go with them. Restore them. If not, get a couple other people who love them deeply and want them back in the fellowship and the, and the life of Christ and try to restore them. And then let the Others in the assembly, remember every church then was not like us. There are people in Wendell Christian Church who don't know the intimate life of other people in, the, in Wendell Christian Church. There are people in Wendell Christian Church who aren't like family to each other. Some people are, and there's a wonderful fellowship that we share. But in the early church, those churches were very small, most less than 20 people when they would get together, and they knew each other. And so let, let the whole family that meets and knows each other and helps each other eat because they were mostly poor. They were feeding each other and getting each other through the hard times. Like get together with them. And if that's not going to gonna do it, then, then just treat them, then just, just treat them like pagans and tax collectors. Just help them know that they're missing out. And again, keep inviting them back into the full experience of the love of God. In fact, if you remember when Barbara was reading the passage, he said, what you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. What you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And again, if you always hear the word heaven as the perfect place up there you go to when you die, then I think you most likely misunderstand Jesus' words in certain cases. Because like in this case, he's saying heaven, which is the dwelling of everywhere. Everywhere that the life of God's happening. In other words, in the past, the present, and the future. Everywhere, heaven. This in, is eternal, uh, timeless space. When you are binding things and growing resentments, it's still there. 
Get together as a church when there's resentments and the resentments are there. Get together at a church when there's forgiveness and forgiveness reigns. Graciousness and resentments. You can tell when they're happening because that's the way it is. Jesus was not saying if you don't forgive sins, then people's sins are held against them forever and ever and ever. And if you lose forgiven sins, then because of your forgiveness, their sins are forgiven. No, it's, he's saying that in your life, in heaven, in all of reality, in the way and places that God is working all the time, when you bind things up, sin's still there. The resentments are still there. And when you let go, the forgiveness happens. So Matthew, I believe, in, really emphasizes the presence of God in his gospel. In fact, at the birth narrative, Jesus is described as Emmanuel, God with us. And at the end in the resurrection story in Matthew 28, he says, go and make disciples of all nations, teach them to observe everything I've commanded you, everything. And I will be with you even to the end of the age presence. So let's just remember that what we're beginning to experience together and share together in this reality as the church is that we are becoming Christ because Christ is present. Emmanuel has happened, and we are Emmanuel. When I live my life as God intends, I get to introduce them to Christ in the form of George Fuller. And you get to introduce people to Christ in the form of who you are when you live in harmony with the will of God and the love of God. And when I don't, people can not meet Christ through me unless I am exhibiting and manifesting Christ in my life. And that's why for me, for you, for us together, for one another, it's important that we focus on helping one another to be transformed and coming to one another in an intimate, private moment, and then only involving the people that would encourage the best. And then if so, bring it to church. And I don't think an institutional church like Window Christian Church um, an institutional church like most, just basically every church that meets in a building, is the context on this passage. I think it's the people who really know one another. So within Wendell Christian Church, I think there are friendships and groups of people within Wendell Christian Church who would help each other to grow as disciples because you have a right in each other's life to speak because you know each other deeply and intimately. Because we are the ones helping each other to do it. Well, I don't know if you guys have read the Chronicles of Narnia or not. Um, I read them to my boys, I think at least twice in their growing up years. But it was wonderful. Or maybe I read it to them once and then they read it themselves. But anyway, the Chronicles of Narnia by C.S. Lewis is a big deal. And a lot of people know the first book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Uh, but actually my favorite of those books is The Voyage of the Dawn Treader. And in The Voyage of the Dawn Treader, the ship's going across and I won't take time to set it up because we don't have time for it. But in that, in that journey, you get a new character. His name is Eustace. Eustace is a new character, and he's brought on into those relationships as one who was brought up in a very privileged household and was very haughty and arrogant and was spoiled by his parents and, and didn't want to get along. And he would, he would play nice, but then you learn in the story that he was writing in his journal and in his letters back home that everyone here was treating him poorly and 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 he was complaining when in reality he had a very easy life and had everything he wanted on this voyage on the dawn treader that that's the name of the ship that they're on so eustace was this this ornery character this spoiled brat of a child who who resented people and then he ends up in this in a circumstance falling asleep next to a dragon i know it's a big leap but stay with me he falls asleep next to a dragon and when he wakes up he has become a dragon and he wants to go on the journey with the Dawn Treader on in towards the land where Aslan is and the, the, the people of Narnia live in this beautiful life. But he cannot go on the journey. He's too big to get on the Dawn Treader because if he gets on the Dawn Treader as a dragon, the Dawn Treader cannot support that much weight. And he longs to go on the journey, but he can't go on. And then Aslan, and Aslan is the picture of Christ, of God, Jesus, Holy Spirit. Aslan is the picture of God. And Aslan, the lion, shows up to Eustace, and Eustace is lamenting the fact that he's a dragon and he can't go on the journey and he hates what he's become. He, he, he repents in, in Christian terms, but in his children terms, he just doesn't like who he has and how he's been, and he hasn't appreciated what people have done, and he laments that. 
and Aslan takes his dragon skin off and it hurts and he has to tear the dragon skin off because he can't go on the journey as a dragon. He tears the dragon skin off and when he tears off the dragon skin, Eustace is there. Not the brat Eustace, not the sinner Eustace, but the beautiful child Eustace that God made and God loves and he feels fresh and new and he's, he's in pain almost living in this freedom. And, and then Aslan puts him deep inside the water and at first the water hurts and then the hurt, water heals him and he braces up out of the water fresh and new as Eustace and is able to go on the journey and it's a symbol of baptism. And that's the way it is with us. When we wander away, we put on the dragon skin. We become someone who can't go on the journey, can't even understand the journey. And then what happens when God does God's work, when the Holy Spirit does the Holy Spirit's work, when Christ does Christ's work, is they tear off this false self, the old self, the sinful self, the flesh just gets torn away. And we're, re we're emerging as our true selves out of the waters of baptism or fresh from the bread and the cup at communion. And we are Christian. And we are becoming Christ together. We are becoming Christ together. We are becoming Christ together. If you would, wherever you are, say it with me as an affirmation and a pledge. We are becoming Christ together. We are becoming Christ together. We are becoming Christ together. May it be so in us and among us. Amen. Let's sing our hymn of commitment, Jesus Calls Us, or the Tumult. Let's sing that. <clears throat> I hope that as you listened to these words that I shared and the scripture that Barbara read for us, uh, that you feel more inclined to respond to a love that's overwhelming than words of condemnation from the Savior who loves you so much. I hope it helps you to want to be to your friends, your neighbors, your brothers and sisters in Christ, even the pagans and the tax collectors of your life to be with the ones among the ones who tell them of Christ's love and show them Christ's love and meet them one-on-one -on -one intimately. Bring a couple of people along with you and help them to know and be restored in or maybe brought into for the first time a fresh relationship with the risen Christ who loves them so much. 
there's any way in which we can help you with that, uh, we want to do that. Now let's share our benediction. If you would, place one hand on your heart and be reminded that Christ does take residence within us. We are the ones who are becoming Christ together. But it begins with each of us and all of us together becoming the people of Christ, making that choice to follow Christ as Lord. And now offer your other hand to the world and go as the assembly, the ecclesia, the church of God, and make disciples of everyone around you. Invite them to know and experience and share the love of God with you. And then help each other to continue to grow into that love so that we may not only share that love, but experience it more for ourselves. So that our witness is but an expression of how much we love and experience the love of God. Amen. do want to encourage you if you are making any commitment today and would like to share that commitment with someone, ask questions or have prayer with someone, you can contact me or one of the elders and we'd be glad to talk with you. And we thank you again for your continued faithfulness in supporting the life of our church together. Um, we're really glad to see you this morning. Um, the number on Zoom was, was up. We thought it might be a low Sunday because of um, Labor Day, but we were glad to see that um, people were, were here, and we're really glad that you're part of it. I know um, um, I just am glad that uh, we're able to be together. Thank you for uh, being with us this morning. Uh, we love you, and we hope that you'll continue to gather with us. Amen. <laughs>